Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is Robert Stark, a contributor to Hunt Review and Substack. How are you doing, Robert? Uh, great. Uh, it's great being on the show. So, Robert, I think that your articles for the Hunt Review are captivating, but you have a special interest in talking about California. But before we begin to discuss your articles on California, I'm going to ask a very simple question. Why are people fleeing California, Robert? Uh, there's many different uh, factors. Uh, there's sort of, uh, there's like an image of California that you get from right wing media. And uh, it's obviously it's based in reality, because like there are, uh, there are like massive homeless encampments, if you go to certain urban areas, but I do think some of the image of, uh, I think some of the image that uh, the right wing populist creative of California, as like this depiction of like a third world country, I think a lot of it is maybe kind of it's based in reality but also kind of over hyped and over exaggerated but i'd say the number one reason people are leaving is just simply the the cost of uh housing yes in one of his recent videos ed duton said that brilliant people live in california but many of them are fleeing to other states so for example they're migrating to texas and other places in the south so ed is predicting that California may no longer be an, o an oasis for geniuses, geniuses in the future. What's your take? Uh, it's, it's hard to say like there is, there is a mass exodus, but uh, that's, that's another thing is like, I think there's an assumption that it's the people with the most wealth who are leaving, like some of them are leaving, but there's also, I've also seen reports that have shown that it's actually the the working class that is mostly leaving. So yeah, there is, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I did it's listen It's a complicated to that. issue. It's complicated. I did listen to Ed Dutton and uh, yeah, I would say that uh, a lot, I do think a lot of the innovation is, le is leaving because like these big uh, giant legacy corporations like uh, Google, uh, they're, they seem to be staying put, but I do think like a lot of the uh, innovative uh, energy and including like startups and and just kind of overall creativity as well. I think that is a lot of a lot of that is sort of leaving the state, but also it's always been the case like there with the United States, especially the western portion of the nation, there is this kind of transient nature of people always relocating and there's always this new kind of up and coming city that's oh, that's is being hyped so like it's Austin and also Miami now. And it was Seattle for a while, and uh, that's always been the case. Yes, but Robert, most innovators are focused people. They tend to fixate on mundane issues. So, for example, engineers pay attention to detail, and California is promoting gender quotas for women and other affirmative action programs for minority groups. But are these policies conflicting with innovation? Because the truth is that most innovators don't have the time to think about identity politics. So if you if you're forcing business people to to, to put women on the board because they're women, isn't that a form of distraction? Yeah, absolutely. It has really ruined uh, ruined academia, and I plan to write about this more. So if, if you talk about like geniuses or innovators, uh, there's really need for like a focus, economic focus, and a focus on education on specialization and this a lot of these policies have been really uh really harmful for that so yeah the whole kind of uh the what you would describe as like a woke culture but california it's actually like one example is there was a ballot measure on affirmative action that got voted down by by a narrow majority so california is not it's not as extreme in that direction as a lot of people assume but the bit the institutions like like uh academia and uh and uh, big tech like the institutions have embraced it but it's not but the ballot measures if you look like if you go over my kind of i posted most of these uh an in in-depth analysis of the election in california on UNS, and i would say that it's actually it shows that the elect the electorate in california despite being kind of solidly blue Democratic voting is actually much more moderate than a lot of people assume. Yes, and in one of your articles, you also submit that some minority groups are voting against Democrats. You refer to Viet Vietnamese. 
yeah, they've uh, with Vietnamese, they've so they're actually the only Asian immigrant group that does vote Republican. That's sort of been a long tradition. So even though like for they did seem to be drifting some of the younger generations drifting uh, Democrat Democratic, but they did switch back for the, Trump got most of those votes. So they mostly live in uh, Central Orange County. And then there's uh, I didn't I didn't necessarily well yeah I, I linked to the, this and my election California election article news and you can see like the there's an in-depth analysis of the electoral map and then there is certain areas like uh, the specifically like the Iranian community around Beverly Hills where there was a shift towards Trump but uh, I'd say overall like the demographic trends is uh trump did slightly better actually trump did slightly better in some of the working class like non-white parts of california but uh but overall he did much worse in california overall among like the more affluent white areas but then but trump actually also did worse among like the rural white parts of california so i'm not i think he did were actually did he did worse, worse overall, but made inroads with some groups. But that was it. Did like my, uh, my, and my analysis of the election was that with the presidential election of uh, Trump versus Biden, it was much more symbolic. But then you do see like there's this large swath of the demographic that voted for Biden, but then voted, but then rejected affirmative action. So when it comes to these ballot measures. If you want to look, if you like have, if someone has like the free time uh, to look at to look at these sort of in depth analysis of the electoral demographics, like you can get a much better better image than just looking at like who, the blue versus red, which does seem to be much more uh, sim, uh, simplistic. But there are all these like nuanced like political and demographic tribes in California. Yes, but Robert, it 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 was quite clear that. Trump did not have a re resounding message during his second term. Yeah, I agree with that. His resounding uh, message. Uh, yeah, it's more, it just seemed like my assessment of Trump is kind of the worst of both worlds because he provided like a boogeyman or kind of like a villain to the left. And he really, I think he did contribute to energizing woke culture. And obviously like the media narrative is obviously biased, but his flaws contributed to that as as well. So it was like the worst of both worlds. So basically like being a Trump supporter was like the equivalent, was being viewed as like being a Nazi, but at the same time, a lot of his policies were pretty standard uh, conservative policies. Like I think I saw, I saw a study that said he was actually as right, or if not more so to the right as Ronald Reagan on uh, economic policies. So it's sort of, but I guess also he wasn't necessarily, I don't think he was really a hardcore social conservative. So maybe uh, kind of drifting more, like more kind of fiscal conservatism rather than like what, kind of what a lot of his initial like hardcore supporters were hoping, like more populism. And then uh, he lost like the, a lot of the original like working class white Obama to Trump voters, uh, Trump lost a lot of that demographic. And then he also lost the affluent white suburbanites, but Trump actually ironically made some inroads among uh, non-whites. Not, not so much, I don't really think the whole, the sort of uh, like pandering to African-Americans, I don't really think that paid off, but he did do significant, he did do somewhat better with Latinos. Yes, and Robert, I was not surprised that Trump managed to garner the support of some African Americans because polls have shown for a long time that Black Americans are less likely to support immigration, even legal immigration. Yeah, that's actually so that's true because they have been uh, Black Americans have been harmed by mass immigration. But on the other hand, uh, I've also seen some studies that have sort of have shown that they used to be more restrict. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm just going off some studies that I've seen. It may have been, uh, it may have been from Zach Goldberg's chart or it may have been from uh, Audacious Epigon on Uns that like with African-Americans, 
in the zero zeros, they had more sympathy towards more restrictionist stances on issues like protectionism or immigration. And then during the kind of 2010s, uh, a great awakening. And uh, there was a kind of shift like with the Black Lives Matter movement where, where African-Americans moved significantly to the left, left on race, but I think not, but not to the, but not to the same degree as uh, as white liberals did, as like Zach Goldberg's chart show. That's the group white liberals move the most to the left on social issues or on racial issues. But uh, I think it just shows kind of polarization because there used to be like a core of people who were maybe democratic voting who were closer to the populist center, but that's basically gone. And the polarization on culture, culture war issues and immigration's part of that too that really was a that really took off after uh throughout the 2010s actually yeah but tr donald trump was a symbolic candidate i remember the trump administration administration saying that donald trump is interested in preserving jobs for minorities and trump was also pro-gay so i'm not surprised that trump lost but donald trump engage in pandering and he was never re rewarded yeah that's true uh, i saw something some uh i think it's some kind of i forget who the author is but some new book alleges that he was even saying kind of like kind of in a private conversation like saying that jared kushner is pushing him to do all this pandering but it's not paying off so yeah i think what happened is that with trump is he moved a bit he moved to the he moved to the right on economics but he moved to the left on uh on racial identity politics as opposed like with the platinum plans uh like one example is like in my article i talk about like there should be specialized platinum plans for all but yeah that was kind of borrowed from from trump's ideas i think he started out and um i think a lot of people sort of uh, assume that it was Kushner's idea, but he started out like pushing like platinum plans for African Americans, and then also I think it was called the American Dream Plan for Latinos, and uh, this was being pushed kind of. This was not really so much at the beginning, but it was being pushed like I think he started really pushing this like before the election, like 2019, and then into the election year like in 2020, and uh, yeah, his debate, yeah, his debate performance and. Uh, the, I'm sure the pandemic, uh, the pandemic is probably a factor as well. But uh, I mean, I don't know. Like, we could have had. I I don't know if it would have, like, it, we we were so caught off guard by that. But uh, yeah, he was blamed for the pandemic because uh, there was. He was maybe reluctant to do a full full on uh, lockdown because it would have for economic concerns. But then. But then there's also like a lot of there's obviously a lot of resentment about the lockdown too and the economic fallout of that. So that may have that may have been like uh, that the pandemic and his economic handling was probably a factor as well. Yes, Robert, can Republicans combat the narrative that they are racist? I. The, yeah, the thing is, is this kind of top-down institutional narrative from the media and the and from academia. So I don't really think it's they can really effectively challenge like a top-down narrative. But I think the problem is, is uh, the the right Republican Party and the right in general, like they don't really and they don't really uh, have a good grasp on institutional power. They've always been thinking in electoral terms, like. How am I going to win over these voters? But they don't. They don't really think in terms of a uh, top-down institutional power, which uh, the other side certainly does. And Robert, what's also interesting is that reports showed showed that parents are critical of anti-racism being taught in school. However, the hatred for anti-racism will not translate into votes for Republicans. One can dislike identity politics and vote for the Democratic Party. And I've often 
I've, I've often told conservatives that they should not partner with liberals who dislike identity politics because they're not real conservatives. Yeah, well, that was what my article on Anun showed about the election. That there's a huge, massive demographic who voted for Biden, but against affirmative action. But I think you're talking about people like, I think that, but that applies like to the kind of like with the intellectual dark web. That's a, uh, I, that's a joke. Oh yeah, but they do seem like they kind of like they oppose wokeness and CRT, but they kind of like critical race theory, but they want to kind of permanently freeze things in the night in the in the liberalism of like the late 20th century and like the 80s and 90s but that also that also applies to uh mainstream conservatives as well so i think like yeah politics you have to kind of build coalitions and like because these because but that also means that you have to kind of build coalitions with groups that are intellectually flawed like you can't really have it's i don't know it's not really feasible yeah, to build a coalition. Yeah, with that, if you don't have the institutional power and you're a small group, like building a small principled, ideologically principled group is very difficult. Well, Robert, I disagree. Let me tell you why. If my ch- channel generates 70 million viewers, this means that I represent the mainstream. People on the right can gain inroads and create a new mainstream. I'm not opposed to partnering with individuals who share different views, but there is a limit to that partnership. I think the right lacks confidence. Uh, I think to a degree, like the right has become pretty demoralized, but I think what happened at the election of the Trump is that I think the right was maybe, uh, they were overly confident and they felt like they were seizing power, but then that kind of went to their head and then uh they were i think in a sense a lot of a lot of right wingers were kind of kind of delusional in in just assuming that because trump was elected they had seized power when obviously they didn't have well that, that was not the case and a lot of these uh yeah kind of led up to all these different disastrous events uh to where we are now yeah, exactly my point. So, for example, you write for the Hoon's Review, and many on the right have written off your publication as nonsense. So, the people on the right are more likely to promote woke writers and BLM than someone like yourself, and that doesn't make any sense. If you if if you are frequently on Twitter post articles written by sensible conservatives. Why post an article to mock a dumb liberal? I know why, because you want followers and there's a need to seem hip. In other words, it's grifting. Yeah, most of it, I think most of like the conservative, most of the conservative movement, uh, including like the mainstream conservatism to kind of like what was described as the alt light I think that's basically the case like it's about owning the libs, uh, like making fun of like the most, like finding the example of like the most sort of obnoxious extreme woke type and ridiculing them, but there's nothing, they have basically no intellectual uh, foundation. Exactly my point. Yeah. And, f- and furthermore, Robert, as a libertarian, I don't dictate to people how they are to organize their lives. But if you call yourself a conservative, I think that you should read Paul Gottfried. Yeah, but I yeah, I don't think it's not really like there's not really a culture of reading intellectual material. It's mostly uh, it's mostly like uh, a lot of it. The right wing is mostly just sort of online watching short clips. People generally have like a short, short attention span and then obviously gets into like a whole other dichotomy about like intellectual elitism versus uh, the average, the potential of the average person populism. And there could be, I mean, there are certainly flaws to populism for those very, for those very reasons. But populism is on the right and on the left. Populism, uh, yes, that's true. P- populism based on the popular concept simply means 
a, pro, a popular policy, a pro-people policy. So for example, I support free trade and free markets. And if ordinary people for, for whatever reason advocate free trade and free markets, that becomes a populist policy. So populism is not necessarily unique to the right or the left. It, it can straddle either philosophy. Yeah, yeah, voting voting for the interests like policies that are that are in the that are in the common good. There's that dichotomy, and then there's also kind of politics based on based on elite like uh, elite top down institutional power or counter counter elitism. Like they're not really like the right doesn't seem to have that much of an interest in building up their own ver their own kind of counter elite of like intellectuals. Uh, also, or in economic, again, technology sectors as well, innovation, they seem to be like you have the, you have the kind of uh, existing conservative uh, billionaire donor base, and then you have the kind of uh, electoral focus. And that was the main, one of the main flaws of Trump is, uh, yeah, Trump supporters assume that they won because they got, they won, uh, because they won electorally, but Trump sort of had to deal with the sort of existing elite power structure. And uh, it was incredibly naive to think in terms of just, just the electoral victory and not and neglecting those other things because Trump, Trump obviously has flaws, but he also had to work within the existing power structure. Like the exist, like what was the uh, like conservatism Inc and the existing sort of GOP uh, structure. He still had to kind of work with them and he didn't really have uh, his, his cabinet choices. Like there were problems with the issues with that. And then also with like the senators, he didn't really even have, he had very few uh, costs, very few, like there was really very hardly any populism in the GOP and even a lot of, and then you also had like a lot of GOP congressmen who claimed the MAGA mantle were pretty, pretty in, like a lot of them were pretty indistinguishable from like the Tea Party era. 20, uh, like 20, 2012 type uh, Republicans. Yes, but but Robert, we have discussed American politics enough, so we're going to move on and talk about pressing issues like your articles on California. We'll be starting with the first article titled California's Future of Pan Enclavism. What is, what, what is that? Pan enclavism is uh, basically uh, how how the demographic trends of a fragmentation. So there was a sort of idea. Uh, there's the idea of like the melting pot in American history, and uh, there's talk of uh, kind of how different political sides are reacting to these trends. So the concern. The left will say talk about racial equity, and conservatives will talk about assimilation. But it just seems uh, so. I post these different various these various maps and link to kind of articles about segregation from more like woke or like kind of lefty sources. But it vindicates that point that this does seem to be the trend is actually it's mo is actually the trend is greater segregation, greater uh, fragmentation. And uh, the left in California, they're they're talking more about like equity-based solutions. So I linked to some articles about like like strategies of how to diversify areas, for instance. All right, and you and you want to diversify these areas to achieve what? Uh, that's not what I'm advocating. That's what the woke left is oh, advocating. Okay, sorry. They want to diversify areas, which I guess they would mean uh more affluent white areas diversify them to achieve their goal of racial equity and then i also make the point that that's sort of a dichotomy that is it's true of major the majority framework throughout throughout american history but it's not really it's not adapted thinking in terms of like the future of california or these more multicultural parts of north america like it also would be applicable to new york or toronto all right, so Robert, I am a realist who is driven by data. And I think that this snippet in your article is very important. And I'm going to read it and then pose a question. 
there is an implication that whiteness is, is racism or at the very least exclusionary of others with the article deliberately uncapping the term white. To give a demographic comparison, California public school en enrollment is only 22.9% white compared with 47% for the United States. The recent massive decline in enrollment, especially white enrollment in San Francisco schools is proof that these woke policies fail at their objective of integration. This statement is significant because human, human capital is important, Robert. And let's not fool ourselves. Whites possess serious human capital. So if they flee California, schools or institutions, shouldn't blacks worry? Uh, no, this is a serious issue. The, the, the greater the exposure to Western technology, the richer the country. Let's not fool ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would agree with that. And, uh, but the thing is, but there's also, I mean, there are other groups that are economically prosperous, like Asians. But yeah, Asians sure. are lower in conformity, Robert. They're lower in conformity, and they're collectivistic, and that's a problem. The 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 leadership class must be serious, bold, and and willing to confront others. So yeah, I don't explicit. I don't explicitly make that point in the article. I make no, more you're not point. making that point. I make the point that they're basically singling out. They're basically saying that we have a multi multi ethnic society, and one group is being singled out as being is being inherently uh, immoral or inherently harmful to others. But I base. But yeah, I think that that's that is a valid that is a valid point. Like uh, to pro so it is so. For the point of California, California has long been this like, beacon of uh, in innovation and in culture and technology. And uh, it is the reality, it is multicultural. We have to kind of embrace that to a degree. But I think it's incredibly harmful if if the state is implementing policies that would drive that would explicitly drive out like European Senate peoples. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yes. And this is also revealing another statement. As for the left's concern about policing in inner city communities, enclaves could have a greater say about policing issues. African American areas, for instance, that have troubled relations with the police would be granted a greater say about local policing, which makes more sense than electing woke days such as Gascon in LA, who impose a disastrous one size fits all approach upon the Whole population expound. Yeah, yeah. So, in one example is like with the New York mayor election. Uh, obviously, Andrew Yang was probably the most. He did poorly, but he was well known. But like, there was a candidate Garcia who was the most like woke on these these ish, policing issues, and their support was mostly from like the white liberal demographic in uh in manhattan but they voted most of the black voters actually did vote for eric adams who was more moderate he was from like a law enforcement background more pro-police so i'm just the point making is that uh if there is so i think i do th yeah i think uh there should be like police officers should be from their community that makes sense so they have a connection but if there was on pan enclavism then there would there would there wouldn't really be need for a narrative of policing issues as like white supremacy or institute or the or a greater centralized institution oppressing a community like the can then the community can sort of decide like what type of policing policies we have and then if crime so if crime does is a problem maybe they can say we do need more police but then then it can be dealt with on the basis of a community rather than it it takes away the sort of the yeah i mean community policing has been some some like pro blm people on the left have been promoting that i think i think probably more like with the original blm movement but that that would resolve a lot of that but it just seems like what's happened now with like this uh so-called racial aw awakening it's just been these very 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 much based upon like top-down uh institutional power and one size fits all so like 
you have these uh, LA County, which has like 8 million people, maybe 6 million people forget, but they voted in, they voted in like this uh, woke DA Gascon and there has been, there has been like a rise in crime and, uh, and then also like the homeless issue as well in LA, but uh, it's just an example of like these failed one size fits all policies that don't respect and address the unique needs of very specific uh, communities. All right. But Robert, who told activists that black communities do not require policing? This is not what polls have been showing. Blacks are in favor have blacks are indeed favorable to the police. They want more police in their community. Yeah, that does that does reflect like the votes how how blacks vote in New York voted for Eric Adams over Garcia in the New York mayor election that ref, that reflects reflects that. So yeah, I think that's probably that I've seen studies that back that up as well, but I still think that with pawn enclavism, you could, there can be more sp specialized specific uh, solutions to these issues. So yeah, if, if there is like, so maybe there is a black community, maybe they do want more, more policing and that's fine, but it should be, should yeah. be done more on a, on a enclavist based level rather than a one sort of like mass mass society under centralized institutions. Yes, so, so Robert, in your piece, you refer to another term that's quite popular in new right circles. The term is ethno-pluralism. What is that? I, I, so I've interviewed a guest about that who written, he wrote a, a German language book on ethno the idea of ethno pluralism, ethno pluralismus, but the, the problem is I haven't really found one concrete definition. So some there's a pretty wide range of positions. So some people advocate like a bunch of like a bunch of independent states based where the borders are drawn up along ethnic lines, and I don't really think that's. I mean that kind of version is not really practical because they're. And the United States, and even increasingly in Western Europe, like there's no geographic areas that are like a hundred percent homogenous. And then there's kind of uh, like there's there's the idea of ethno ethno federalism, where regions are given like some degree of auto semi autonomy. And then also talk about I think like those those are le like less politically feasible, but I do think like the very least, like there should be freedom of association and more empowering local jurisdictions to, and sort of a, it's, to allow sort of enclavism to, to evolve organically rather than, like, I don't really see it as, I don't really see there being as being like top-down implementation. All right, Robert, but I agree with, with you. As a libertarian, I don't have a problem with units of racial autonomy. So I think what you're saying sounds quite feasible. The element of freedom of association yes. or the more the idea of ethno No, not, not, uh, well, not I, I'm talking about re autonomy. So for example, if blacks decide to segre segregate in Alaska, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, that's autonomous units. Yeah, I would agree. That, that's what et, ethno pluralism is a European concept. I think that they are suggesting that U Europe is a region of pluralism and various identities in Europe ought to be able to maintain their distinctness. I think that's what they're, what they're proposing. Act, actually, I had someone talking about the issue sometime. sometime yeah, ago. so it is, uh, it's based out of. Uh, it is like a European based movement. So what I'm advocating is maybe it overlaps, it's influenced by it, but it's based on the American framework or even more specifically on California. So it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be obviously different than European ethno pluralism. Yes, and Robert, in your piece uh, 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 on, uh, on California, you also mentioned Yimbis. Do you support the Yimbi movement? 
I support a lot of their goals, but I also think that uh, they they are heavily aligned with like woke woke policies as well, which obviously is problematic. But there is like there is a sort of massive uh, exodus, and uh, the the just the sheer cost of living is just not sustainable. So I do think yeah I do support like. Uh, especially in these like core areas like LA and the Silicon Valley, I do think they need to be, there needs to be like a massive up, up zoning in those areas. So yeah, I'm generally like, I wouldn't, I have just dis some disagreements with the YIMBY movement. I'm not officially part of, I'm not like part of their core movement, but I'm sympathetic to a lot of their, their objectives. But I also think like there are, there are flaws as well. For instance, a lot of the liberal, a lot of the liberal yimbies would be very hostile to like the concept of freedom of association and there's a woke component too so uh, i reference actually i reference this theme the most in my article on substack uh pod living versus the single family home of false dichotomy no actually initially in owns and i reposted it on substack how a lot of yimbyism is woke taint is kind of woke tinted so they'll talk about upzoning as a way to diversify uh, whites like white suburban areas. Yeah, we, Yimbyism as an economic goal, but it has been infiltrated by wokeist and deranged liberals. So, for example, let me read this ex excerpt from the Ur the Urban Institute. What stands in the way of African American or Latino aspirations is not mostly race or discrimination, but a policy environment that discourages or even bans new home building, particularly, particularly in the less expensive periphery. The assault on suburban construction and single, single family housing has been a major factor in driving median house prices in the coastal California metropolitan areas of Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, and San Jose. It has risen from more than 125% above the national average to nearly 400% above it in the first quarter of 2020. So if one is interested in improving the, standard, the living standards of minority groups, then yimbism makes sense, but it's very difficult to divorce yimbism from left-wing activism. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So the, the, medium, the medium housing cost is uh, anywhere, anywhere like any of the coastal urban areas in California, the average housing cost is like at a minimum, it's basically close to a, it's basically close to a million now and that's just not not uh that's just not sustainable and uh there, i mean there's so many countless issues that there other political issues that are attached to it so i think besides the woke stuff like i think some conservative populist will try to kind of associate it they'll try to associate it with like maybe like the kind of great reset agenda and destruction of an ownership society, but I think that's foolish because because you can't. In order to have a ownership society, you want you want prices to be reasonable. So most people, so at very least, like or at very least, like the middle class to be able to purchase a home. And uh, yeah, like I do, like I ref, kind of reference like uh, Joel Kotkin as well, who's a kind of centrist to center right columnist uh, in California yes. and he does he does write a lot about he has a book out of neo-feudalism but then he also he also kind of has this notion that the only way to achieve the middle class American dream is through a single is through a single family home which mm -hmm. uh, it has in the past but I also think that's not really that's just not really adapted to the, the to current the current trends and then obviously as we discussed like uh, for for Yimbyism to be viable, like you do have to kind of divorce it from the woke, like the woke stuff, because it's sort of like inter, it's a concept of intersectionality where everything is related in, in a woke sense. But I would just say, I would, pref I generally look at each issue uh, on a case by case basis and what makes sense on an individual policy basis and what obviously reject intersectionality. Yes, 
Robert, you seem to have a political streak, so I'm going to talk about your article and an alternative vision for California. You propose some rather interesting recommendations. Platform, CA state basic income, eligibility, all adult US citizens who have been living in California for at least five years. Tell us about some of your suggestions, Robert. Yeah, that is just the, the basic the basic income proposal. And uh, I have an article, a whole article dedicated to that. But I do think if it if it were to if it were to be viable, there would need to be like a diversified uh, sources of, of revenue. And uh, I'm actually critical of Yang's version of basically funding most of it via uh, VAT tax. So oil, so like oil dividend extraction tax is part of it. I advocate like automating uh, bureaucracies, uh, obviously political barriers to that. Uh, let's see, uh, like kind of consolidating some existing state programs into the into the basic income and then uh, And those are just those are just uh, some examples of revenue sources. Yes, and I'm particularly interested in this recommendation: reform regulations and the licensing process to empower the self the self employed and entrepreneurial. Occupational licensing is a big burden. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, uh, one of the one of the recent show one of the shows I did. The one the show I did with Nicholas Wildstar running for governor, he has a background in libertarianism. Uh, he he mentioned the specific policy. I forget the name, but there was a assembly bill that Newsom signed into law that makes things especially pretty harsh on uh, on like the self-employed. And you also recommend another feature that is that is quite interesting and sensible increase and support community policing programs R robert the pol the police are being paid to prevent criminality and criminals are dangerous people so police officers must exercise force however i do support psych psychological training and and measures to bridge the gap between police and civilian relations. So for example, I some would argue that empathy can be taught, thought, others disagree, but I do believe that, that there is a role for psychology and training, but not anti-racism. So I think this is an interesting- Oh thought. yeah, so with community policing as, uh, I, I, what I have in mind is more the idea of police being, having a stronger connection to the community. But I do think with community policing, it's kind of been, so yeah, it has been kind of associated with like anti-racism yes, ideology and, and police. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the police must exert sport, uh, sorry, not sport, force. We cannot expect police officers to behave like wimps. They, they have to be aggressive. But at the same time, it would be good to teach them how to deal with individuals suffering from mental health challenges. But... However, this is not a recommendation to turn the police force into an agency for social welfare. Yeah, it shouldn't be if there's, uh, obviously there could be like a, like they do, there are proposals or implementation of like a psychological t task force that works with the police, but you can't really have the police like become like social workers. That's obviously not gonna work. Yes. And Robert, now we can move on to the more interesting articles. So there's a piece published by Uns titled The Denmark Plan Versus Right-Wing Multiculturalism. Tell us a little about it. Uh, that was in response to Denmark's policies about putting residency restrictions based upon uh, demographic quotas. So right-wing multiculturalism is closer uh, that's closer to the pan like pan enclavism or what i've uh, been what i've been advocating and uh, this seems to be more it is very like it in some ways it is very kind of draconian from a liberal standpoint but is more kind of based on the assimilationist model so uh 
but obviously their Europe has a very different framework as the United States. And yes. I think it could, it could, this model could work, but as Denmark is still pretty, pretty homogenous, I guess the point I make, it would not work somewhere that is extremely diverse. Uh, obviously, uh, United in the United States, but the par- par- portions of Europe, like uh, like London or Paris, it would not work. But Robert, how do we reconcile diversity and assimilation? So, for example, we preach assimilation, but some some migrant groups may be against assimilation. However, if they do not assimilate into the broader culture, this may be a recipe for a disaster. So it's a tricky issue. We want to respect the rights of migrants, but at the same time, we prefer for them to assimilate. Yeah, it does. And I, I'd say like with Europe, uh, depending like where the sources of migrants are from, and then European culture is more, it's more based on, because it's based more on ethnicity, then it's, yeah, you're not really going to see assimilation but i think in, in america you actually have seen you've seen but i don't so i don't really see assimilation happening in europe but in america you do see a co- kind of a combination of both like you see pan enclavism but you do you have seen like a lot of groups have uh have assimilated so that's more nuanced yes uh, according to research america has succeeded at assimilating migrants and many people from Spanish speaking countries actually prefer to speak English. That's the, that's a trick, the, tr- the trick of, of America. When people migrate to America over time, they usually assimilate, but this is no longer the case because so on, I, you may go ahead. Oh yeah, to kind of clear, to clarify is, uh, I think in the past there was, but I just see, so with the article Pan Enclave is in California, I think there was in the past, but I don't think, I think at the point we're at now, like I don't see. So I think with future, future groups of people that come here, uh, I see a shift. So I don't really see assimilation. I don't see it really continuing because, be, just because of, for two reasons, because of how diverse the nation is and also because of the ideologies of wokeness. Wokeness actually ironically leading to more, more granted greater neo, neo-tribalism but uh, if you, but I think like with uh, for like the first waves of of immigrants uh, who came from non-Western origin, like the first big waves from like the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, like you did see a lot of assimilation. But yes. that's not that's not going to be the case in the future. Yes, and th- this is why immigration may not be feasible even if immigration is correlated with economic growth and on and entrepreneurship it can become a risk if we're inviting people to live in america however they're being taught that the founding fathers were wicked or that the aztecs are more admirable than the than the founding fathers are western philosophers what sense does it make to encourage individuals to live in america and then say okay I'm happy that you are an American citizen, but the country is crap. Yeah, it's not. It's not. If your objective is to maintain America as one cohesive unit, then that's obviously then it's obviously a disaster. But I do sort of notice trends of like post-Americanism. Like, I don't know if I'm not even like there are secessionist movements like Calexit or the Texas independence movements, but I could just very well see a scenario where America exists well into the future as one political unit on paper as far as like defined borders, but there's no sense of a, co- of Ameri- of a cohesive American identity or people based on, even besides like things like culture, ethnicity, like, or any, any shared principles, like it will be sort of, it will exist as a unit, but it'll be like a multi- multicultural empire, which is basically like what we, we've had plenty of those in the past, like going back to the, like the Ottomans or the Byzantines, or the, even the Roman empire. Yes, Robert, empire building is not unique to Europeans. Before America was colonized by white people, Native Americans fought brutal wars. 
and colonize each other. That's the norm in history, not the exception. Oh yeah, like plenty of other examples, like the the Mongol Empire or the Bantu extent. Exactly, the Bantu in expansion in in Africa, and the 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 Mongolian Empire, according to one writer, affected I Iran for about ten centuries. And he notes that the implications are very negative and persistent, but we do not hear, hear or see people on TV saying the, Mon the Mongols should repent for empire building or the Bantu people should apologize. Only Westerners are implored to genuflect to the demands of minorities, even though the West abolished slavery. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, I don't really think like having, because it's the thing is like, if you're, if you're, if your political adversary is that, is that hostile, like, I don't really think you can sort of have, it's hard to have like a debate about these uh, moral principles. Uh, you just have to kind of reject, I think you can, you can point out those examples and kind of reject the narrative. But I also think that a, a lot of right wing populists, like including Tucker Carlson, devote a lot of their energy to pointing out like political and moral hypocrisy. But I think there's limitations to that because I think pointing out hypocrisy is just it's just complaining that your adversary is winning. Like it's okay to do, but I don't think it's a super effective strategy. Yeah, meme culture does not work in the real world. So, so for example, Tucker Carlson recently did a feature on Don Lemon to expose his hypocrisy. But I doubt that it will garner much support outside of the right wing base. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that seems to be it's mostly just speaking to his base. I as far as like pointing out like say hypocrisy of liberal elites, like will it bring in I'm not really sure if it will bring in allies from like the more the more populist left. Like you have like the dirtbag left because they'll some I think they'll sometimes make some of the same points. So I'm not opposed to pointing out hypocrisy, but I just think it's not it's not viable if it's like as, as your main strategy. It's okay to do, but you shouldn't like count on it. And and what needs to be studied is that identity politics can become a risk to the security of America. Groups groups that are able to cooperate will do better in warfare than divided groups. Therefore, if soldiers are being taught by their superiors that America is racist or that whiteness is a symbol of evil, this will deplete morale and confidence in the army. Therefore, can we truly expect the American military to fight a real war, even though it's technologically superior to most countries? Because yeah. wars are one when leaders are confident. And if your technology is up to standard, but your men are defenestrated, can you truly win a war? Yeah, I don't, I think it will like, even with the, like, the technological and military uh, superiority of America, I think it will just uh, cause division, lead to demoralization. And uh, I think just kind of like, like exacerbate exacerbate and accelerate this trend of uh, the end, kind of the end of the era of like Pax Americana. And we're already seeing the, the decline. I mean, the American empire, even though it has uh, the strongest, it's still, I mean, by far, even beyond China, it has like the most powerful military, but uh, it's dramatic. I do think America is going, is losing a lot of its, uh, a lot of its soft power, like it does seem like we'll probably see the end of America hegemony sometime within the next 20 to 30 years. Exactly. I, I see the next 20 years. And recently I read a, a scholar who was affiliated to the Hoover Institution, and he was arguing that the Chinese are weaponizing identity politics to shame Americans. Oh yeah, but didn't the, the Soviets do the same thing in like yeah. Africa and Latin America. Yes, yes. But the difference between Soviet propaganda and Chinese propaganda is the moralistic notion of identity politics. Unfortunately, too many people take anti-racism seriously. 
Yeah, so you're saying propaganda no, to, no, to, the, I, to the parts of the world that are under, like, the Xenosphere, like the Chinese yeah, 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 yes. imperialism. Yeah, and, and I'm also arguing that because of the moralistic content of anti-racism, it's easier to harness the support of people. Because if you don't agree with the premise of anti-racism, according to the mainstream, you're, you're a wicked man. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. But I think like the Chinese are probably doing that. But uh, I think America, the thing is like America, like America is doing enough of it on its own. So like the like with so with say like support for BLM and these policies globally are very much attached to uh, the American like the American the influence of American soft power. Uh, like especially uh, like social media, Hollywood and uh, government agencies like globally. So yeah, even if you, cause I think when that, when these like BLM, uh, the, when the protests and the riots were happening last year, like there, the map show the places that where they were at, where they were happening were all under like American uh, influence. So like there's, there's parts of Africa where there's very little American influence and there was basically non-existent uh, BLM presence. Like it was confined to where the places that were Americanized or Westernized. Yes, and and I'm glad that you, you, you contend that America does not need China to destroy the American empire. So for example, Tucker Carlson was recently upbraided for giving credence to the great replacement theory, but he's right. One does not need to import immigrants to replace white people because philosophically whites no longer exist. So I oh yeah <laughs> yeah so the the great replacement is a philosophical war. It's not about immigration per se. It's it's based on ideas. Yeah, because uh, I think the, the, another critique of the right is I think the right wing has been the i'd say like the dissident right especially they've been obsessed with like the the pers the demographic percentage of the country like that's been this obsession with the great replacement that this year when whites will become a majority in the united states but i think it's actually like it's always it's the top down ideological framework and it's elites that that set the agenda for a society so I think conservatives, not not so much conservatives, but the the populist right or the identitarian right, like they're, I think their maybe priorities have been a bit off. Yes, when Coca Cola is teaching its employees that that being white is a problem, you do not need immigrants to destroy the culture. You have replaced yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure, and. Uh, that, I mean, I also make the point, another article I'd recommend looking at is the one on Uns, is that you can't, I'm not sure if you read this one, but the one, you can't take back your country, but uh, you can join the tribe. And I also kind of critique the kind of, the kind of fatalistic all or nothing mentality, mentality of the right. And I but present right-wing multiculturalism as, it's not, it's, it's, has, it's obviously flawed, and, uh, and I haven't even decided upon a term like right wing multiculturalism, pluralism, pan enclavism. Like, there's not one co coherent term, but uh, that that's presented as an alternative, even though it's uh, it may be flawed. Yes, and Robert, you also produced another article, and I was planning to talk about it early earlier. Since we're on the topic of demography, I think it's necessary to mention it. It's titled "Who Breeds in California." Oh yeah, so that that's an in-depth analysis of uh, fertility trends in California. But the thing is, is uh, that it, most of it is based off the 2010 census data, and uh, the 2020 census data that will be that will be available more in depth like later this year. So the article, it's worth looking at to get a good a good sense of 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 these uh, demographic trends but it, it's important to point out that it is mostly based upon the 2010 census for california yeah and and what's also interesting is that educated black women are less likely to have children similar in, in similarly to 
where white peers were educated. So who breeds is actually a problem on many levels. So even yeah. So I found I found that with uh, with blacks and Latinos there is there is an extreme fertility to divide among among class. But I found with uh, with whites it was not. But the thing is, in California, there isn't really like there isn't a strong white proletariat. They exist more more kind of in pockets in like the rural parts of the Northern California. But I wasn't able to find a coherent uh, trend among whites based upon class. All right, but as someone who's interested in this genetics, it's always good to study breeding patterns. But lastly, Robert. This topic is also equally pertinent. Income inequality is always in the news, but when are we going to discuss intergenerational inequality? Oh yeah, I did. I wrote about, I've written about that a lot on my most recent article on property taxation and the zoning housing divide. And then I wrote, wrote an article about, that was my first article on the intergenerational wealth gap on UNS. That's that's an issue nationwide, but I'd say like the housing, the YIMBY versus NIMBY issue especially encapsulates that for California. Yes, Robert. And I'm la laughing because apparently Bloomberg wants us to celebrate becoming a nation of renters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the propaganda, it's amazing how how blatant it's become because it used to be it used to be there was more there was more nuance, more subtle subtleties. But it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty blatant uh, propaganda. And obviously, uh, for most people are renters, like for, because they, that's obviously their, their only option. It's not feasible to purchase a home, but it's just amazing how blatant it is, the propaganda. Yes, and, and these gaps are quite huge. And this is one reason why rich people tend to like identity politics because it, it, it's a camouflage for their nefarious intentions. If we're invested in identity politics, we, we don't discuss the fact that some Americans may end up living a life that's worse than their parents and grandparents. Yeah, it has been. Identity politics has been a big distraction from, from e economic concerns for sure. Yes, but like even every, even a lot of the you see this with uh, Democrats, like do you had like Bernie Sanders and AOC were initially the big figures of like economic, bro. Like, bro well, AOC I have zero respect for Bernie. I used to have I, I had a degree of respect for him, but in 2016, but then 2020, even though he kind of caved in to uh, identity politics, yes. and then AOC that's her main focus. She basically abandoned any core economic principles from like a left-wing populist perspective. So the squad, uh, like all those types, they're total, they're total, they're like a total joke. Yes. But you see that like the more, the more establishment neoliberal Democrats like, uh, like Kamala Harris are mostly primarily focused upon identity politics. Yes, yes. Because rich people benefit from re renewable subsidies. However, when identity politics is promoted as the most serious problem in the world, we will forget that billionaires and millionaires benefit from subsidies. It's, it's, it's simple logic. But before we go, Robert, I must say that AOC, AOC is comic relief. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. A A A AOC is just comic relief. Yeah. And, and to tell the truth, I don't think that she's smart. Some persons would argue that A AOC is manipulating us into getting attention. No, she's not that smart. She's literally just a silly girl. And I, I, yeah. I, I don't want to talk about her for a long time, but perfect example. AOC studied economics at a fairly prominent university in Boston. And five years after graduating, she was still working as a bartender. Okay, then. Does she have networking skills? What are her expertise? So I... Yeah, I, yeah like she does have... Yeah, she what, seems more like a social... Like a social media celebrity yeah, what's rather than a serious yes. political uh, intellectual. Like Bernie, even with Bernie... I have criticisms of Bernie Sanders, but I... He has like a long track record as uh, 
as a left-wing intellectual, like I have, I have some degree of respect for Bernie, but very little for AOC. All right, but Robert, it was a pleasure to speak to you, and I'm going to say bye. Okay, then. Thank you. It was great All speaking right. with you. Take care. Bye. Yeah. And uh, okay. I have to get, I have okay, to get going.